Since the 20th Party Congress, President Xi has been preparing China for what he calls dangerous storms. Those preparations are now gaining momentum in a number of areas. China's reliance upon its domestic energy is about 80%. 实际上，中国的粮食安全啊，一直都是中国政府最重视的啊议题。China's always been acutely aware of dollar dependency and the potential for sanctions to affect its access to international capital market. What does it mean to prepare for dangerous storms? Wuhan is known internationally as the first city that was locked down in China's fight against COVID-19. But within China, it has a different reputation. The industrial park here, known as Optics Valley, is among the leading high-tech clusters in the country. There are more than 4,000 tech companies located here. Optics Valley is also home to several domestic memory chip manufacturers. If there was ever a place that represents China's efforts to wean its dependence on overseas technology, this would be it. And the most prominent of all the tech companies is this one. President Xi visited HG Tech in June 2022. He toured the production lines for laser cutting equipment used in the semiconductor, consumer electronics, and automobile industries. He also encouraged the company to make technological breakthroughs fast. Beijing wants more success stories like HG Techs to emerge. It's playing an active role in supporting tech companies and in a number of ways. Here in Hubei province alone, 100 billion yuan, or 14.9 billion US dollars, was spent on supporting research and development in the year 2021. That's up 43.5% from 2017, according to Chinese media. At Optics Valley, companies can also tap on a 1 billion yuan science and technology angel investment guidance fund. There are also incubators and maker spaces to support creativity, tax breaks, marketing support. And universities here are well funded, producing more than 1.3 million college graduates for hire. China's investment towards tech independence extend well beyond Optics Valley. For decades, Chinese government has been uh, paying a lot of attention and uh, investing a lot into the uh, tech sectors. But these days, in the new situation, especially in the context of uh, China-US rivalry, actually the Chinese government has increased its investment into the tech sectors uh, tremendously. For example, we see that actually China is, in, is encouraging a lot of uh, tech firms uh, to be listed in Chinese stock markets, which also help these firms to uh, get investments, uh, get help from the public as well. 
And also the Chinese government is also promoting a lot of uh, tech-related uh, uh, officials. Sometimes we call them uh, technocrats into the key positions. And this will also help them to uh, be better involved in all kinds of initiatives that help Chinese tech, technology, and science uh, departments. President Xi has visited dozens of high-tech companies to emphasize the importance of technology independence. Zi Nationally, the Chinese government has set aside more than 10 trillion yuan establishing about 1,800 government guidance funds to invest in strategic tech sectors. Another 200 billion yuan had been pledged specifically for semiconductors. The Chinese government is even considering expanding that to 1 trillion yuan. Drew Thompson has been tracking developments in China for decades. He's a former U.S. Defense Department official responsible for managing bilateral relations with China. They've invested trillions of renminbi, um, provided subsidies that we probably can't even count, um, and really pushed the sector forward to develop new technologies that make them independent of Western technologies. But they're still not meeting their objectives, and they're still struggling uh, to, to achieve that independence that they want. And I think this tells us that there's something wrong uh, in the system. There's something wrong in the governance model uh, for that sector. There's uh, perhaps political interference in individual organizations, laboratories, companies, uh, disincentives perhaps that are baked into the system that are uh, hurting China's ability to achieve that independence despite the tremendous resources going to it. So I think more money isn't going to solve the problem. But President Xi's message of technological independence is one that resonates well within China. The U.S. decision to deny China access to advanced semiconductors in October 2022 proves to the Chinese that their leader was spot on. Semiconductors are generally considered the weak spot in China's industry. And in 2020, China imported 378 billion U.S. dollars worth of the product. The United States Chips and Science Act targets a variety of things. Here's one of them. This is the Tianhe supercomputer. When it was unveiled in 2010, it earned the title of world's fastest computer.
After winning the title of the world's fastest computer in 2010, China's supercomputers held on to that top spot for seven years, gaining computational speed every year. Gumbalazia, Supercomputers are viewed as an indicator of national technology leadership, and they are vital for many functions, in areas ranging from the development of new aircraft, to satellite launches, to construction calculations, to developing high-speed trains. Of course, supercomputers are also required to develop advanced military technology, it is no secret that Tianhe is developed by China's National University of Defense Technology. Leadership in supercomputing is vital to a range of national interests. Mr. Meng, the creator of Tianhe and a proud member of the Communist Party, explains the supercomputer's many uses. <laughs> Take medical diagnosis, for example. The usual process to diagnose for breast cancer involves a mammogram, MRI, and a biopsy. But a partnership between the hospital and the Tianhe supercomputing team promises to shorten and simplify the process. Just the U.S. ban on advanced chips to China affects the development of the supercomputer, which in turn impacts many areas of the economy, like healthcare, engineering, and other fields. In the 2021 list of global top 500 supercomputers, 186 Chinese supercomputers made it to the list. In November 2022, there are 162 Chinese computers on the list. Though China is the global leader in terms of the total number of supercomputers, its top machines are not keeping pace with its competitors. Of the top 10 supercomputers listed in November 2022, only two were from China. It was widely reported in Chinese media that these rankings are a direct result of the U.S. government's technology squeeze. The U.S. Uh, uh, sanctions on chips definitely will also have an uh, impact upon China's uh, supercomputer development, uh, since uh, this kind of development also needs uh, numerous uh, kinds of uh, chips and semiconductors. This kind of uh, technological ban is uh, unprecedented and across the board, and will have very comprehensive and uh, a long-term impact upon China's uh, industry and the technology. So now we see that a lot of uh, China's key tech firms like Huawei and other firms actually now face the shortage of uh, chips, for example, and also some uh, other related uh, equipments and the technology. So that actually hinders their 
uh, development and manufacturing of uh, their products and services. So in the short term, definitely that would have huge impact upon China's uh, high-tech industry, and that may even shrink some of uh, its global market share uh, in the short term. Every time we hear about technology export bans to China, we also hear some Chinese commentators saying that this is good for China. It is giving the Chinese more impetus to innovate. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, to some extent, I think the statement is true, as uh, once uh, you have to rely on yourself, uh, definitely that would boost your innovation capacity and speed. But on the other hand, we also see that every country has its own competitiveness, the strengths and the weaknesses in terms of technological innovation. So I would say that China would never reach a point when the country can provide all the technology, all the equipment it needs to develop the high-tech uh, sectors. So that's why I would, I would say that actually even with uh, its own uh, innovation, uh, uh, domestic innovation, the country still needs uh, key technologies and core equipments from other countries. Energy security. It's something that has become an area of focus for all governments, especially after the war in Ukraine jacked up global energy costs. China has said it will prioritize energy security, and it is putting its money where its mouth is. Hydrogen has been hailed as a fuel of the future. According to Goldman Sachs, green hydrogen could supply up to 25% of the world's energy needs by 2050 and become a 10 trillion US dollar market in that year. But some big obstacles need to be overcome for that to happen globally. Hydrogen, or H2, is the most abundant element in the universe, but pure hydrogen is very scarce. To make it, molecules need to be split, and that requires energy. To qualify as green, it has to be made from renewable energy. And that is what they have done here in Ningxia, where a solar system powers the entire hydrogen plant. Inside, hydrogen is made by electrolyzing water. Hydrogen 绿氧替代我们的燃料煤，绿氢替代我们的原料煤，这样呢就实现了用可再生能源替代化石能源生产近百种化学品。形象的说呢，就是一缕光加一滴水，生产一匹布。If green hydrogen is produced at scale, it could help decarbonize industries and enhance energy security at the same time. It could also be used to heat homes and offices and fuel hydrogen-powered vehicles. So by 2025, China aims to give more importance to industrial byproduct hydrogen um, and to develop technologies um, for production and transportation of green hydrogen. So that means um, the, uh, there will be about 50,000 fuel cell vehicles and 300 hydrogen refueling stations. So that's pretty um, impressive already. Now by 2030, um, China aims to what it's called establish an innovative hydrogen sector with reliable supply system for green hydrogen. To achieve those goals, China will have to build many more of these plants. This may be the largest one in the world now, but an even bigger one is coming on stream in Xinjiang in late 2023. 我们这个装置呢，一年可以生产两亿方的这个氢气和一亿方的氧气。这个用到我们的化工系统呢，每年可以减少我们化石原料的消耗约三十二万吨，降低我们二氧化碳的排放约五十五万吨。To achieve its energy security goals, China will of course need to have a mix of energy sources. New coal-fired electricity plant approvals have tripled in 2022 compared to 2021. Nuclear 
is also being rapidly ramped up. Welcome to China's oldest nuclear power plant. This facility in Qingshan was built in 1991 and has operated safely for more than 30 years. When they first started, China had little knowledge of nuclear power and had to send its engineers overseas for training. Mr. Zhu was amongst the first batch of operators at Qingshan who trained abroad. But over time, intensive R&D led to the country becoming a major player in the field. In 2020, China built its first domestically designed nuclear reactor named Hualong-1. The Hualong-1 reactor has the capacity to produce 10 billion kilowatt hours of electricity per year. According to China state media, that's enough to meet the energy demands of a million people. The Hualong technology has more than 700 patents and 120 software copyrights, and all of its 411 core parts were designed and manufactured domestically in China. Not only is China ramping up its production of nuclear energy locally, it is also exporting its technology to Pakistan and Argentina. So currently, the share of nuclear power in China is about 5%. So that sounds small, um, but it's already the third largest installed capacity of nuclear energy in the world after the United States and after France. And to also um, explain a little bit and understand the scale and the acceleration of renewable nuclear power, by 2020, China had about 49 nuclear power generation units. By 2021, there were 55. Um, in 2022, um, the China started construction of another 10 nuclear reactors. So that was a yearly record so far. And the goal over the next five years is to um, continue this um, extension of nuclear power with a rhythm of about, of about six to eight nuclear power unit um, generations approved um, every year. During the 20th Party Congress, the deputy director of the National Energy Administration said, China's self-sufficiency rate of energy supply was maintained above 80%, helping the country overcome severe challenges brought about by the pandemic, natural disasters, as well as the impact from the global energy price turbulence. President Xi called for even greater energy self-sufficiency during the 20th Party Congress when he told the nation to prepare for dangerous storms. So in China's 14th five-year plan, so that's the one from 2021 to 2025, the energy self-sufficiency rate is set at 84% compared to the current 80%. In order to understand China's energy self-sufficiency, we need to um, look at uh, China's energy um, structure and of course also its energy endowment. The coal remains by far the biggest component of China's energy sources, uh, contributing about 55% of the energy, followed by oil, 19%, and natural gas, 8 to 9%. In other words, China is absolutely dependent upon fossil fuels. 
China lacks mostly in oil and natural gas. And it relies on imported oil and natural gas um, for its consumption. In this case, China, as long as it's dependent on fossil fuels, um, it is becoming less self-sufficient. And what are the two um, strategies? Number one, increase domestic production of fossil fuels. And at the same time, of course, China is accelerating the use of low carbon and clean energy. Over 60% of China's oil consumption comes from other countries. So that's why China always faces this kind of uh, Malacca uh, dilemma. The dilemma of Malacca Strait was first emphasized by the previous uh, communist leader, Hu Jintao. He realized that actually China relied too much on the oil uh, transportation through the uh, Malacca Strait. And if one day, uh, for example, due to the uh, geopolitical tension and uh, all the uh, South China Sea disputes, when the, this kind of uh, sea line has been cut off, China may face huge energy security problem. This is a Manaka uh, dilemma. China has taken many steps to address this, including building a strategic multi-billion dollar oil and gas pipeline in Chaopiu in Myanmar. More than 80% of China's oil imports used to have to pass through the Malacca Strait. Now, some of that goes through Chaopiu in Myanmar before passing through the hills of Yunnan and the city of Kunming, which is the capital of Yunnan. A good example is the, the pipelines in, in Myanmar, which uh, is probably very expensive. I've been to the border crossing at Ray Li a few times where the pipeline comes across. It's, uh, it's a major undertaking, um, but I mean, just think of the physics. You have to pump oil all the way to the, what's the altitude of Kunming? It's five, 6,000 feet. I mean, it's almost a mile high. Um, you're pumping oil vertically over a very long distance. It's gonna be very expensive oil. Um, but if that gives them security, then they're willing to pay that premium. Food security. That's been a policy priority for the Chinese government since President Xi instructed people not to waste food in 2020. With global food prices increasing sharply after the Ukraine invasion, discussions about food security in China have taken on an even more urgent tone. <laughs> But it's a difficult task feeding 1.4 billion people. It's a well-known fact that China is home to one-fifth of the global population, but has only 7% of the world's arable land. China's farmlands are also not as productive when compared to the world's top producers. For example, corn output per hectare in China, according to a new Goldman Sachs report, is 40% lower than in the US. And it takes Chinese farmers between 6 and 26% more grain to produce a kilo of pork or chicken than their American counterparts. But just as Chinese scientists have overcome difficulties in nuclear energy technology or laser manufacturing, so too is transformation taking place in the agricultural sector. Focus is of course placed on rice, which is an essential part of the diet of nearly every person in the country. In the city of Qingdao, scientists have developed a hybrid strain that produces higher yields while being more climate resilient. It's called sea rice, and it can even grow in tidal flats and saline alkaline land. Traditionally, rice is grown in fresh, clean water. It's a crop that is especially sensitive to salt content. 
but Chinese scientists have managed to crack the code. Research on seawater rice was pioneered by Yuan Longping, China's father of hybrid rice, who's regarded as a national hero for boosting China's grain harvests. The research done by Mr. Yuan and his team is critical to China's food security. China has a large amount of saline alkaline land that previously could not be used for agriculture. The amount of such land is estimated to be about the size of Egypt. Recent farming techniques, such as the intensive use of fertilizer, has only added to the problem. So important is Mr. Yuan's contribution that when he died in year 2021 at the age of 91, Tens of thousands of mourners turned up for his funeral despite the COVID-19 pandemic. People came not just from his home city of Changsha, but from all over China. The public outpouring of emotion underscores the importance of food security discussions in China. Today, a new generation of agronomists carry on the work of Mr. Yuan. There's been a big push towards the use of technology in Chinese agriculture. For example, Beijing has called on local authorities to set up a network of greenhouses, high-tech ones that have automated irrigation, temperature and lighting management systems. There's also research emphasis on seeds, which are considered the microchips of agriculture. In 2017, the Chinese spent 43 billion to acquire Syngenta, a Swiss agritech group whose large business portfolio includes seeds. The same year, 
The Chinese also paid 1.1 billion for some of the Dow Chemical Company's corn seed business in Brazil. I think China will increase the supply of corn to about 3%. The first is the absolute Chiefly,保证百分之九十八亿亩耕地的红线 China has been working especially hard to diversify its food imports away from one major supplier in particular. The United States used to be China's largest agricultural supplier. In 2021, Brazil overtook the U.S. for the top spot and now provides 20% of China's agricultural imports. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the U.S. imposed a series of sanctions. Russian banks were kicked out of SWIFT, paralyzing its financial sector. The world uses the SWIFT international payment network to pay for practically everything. Every day, five trillion US dollars get transferred across the world using the system. Being excluded from SWIFT means not being able to conduct cross-border transactions. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the US weaponized the dollar. How did China view this? This kind of financial uh, uh, security is another uh, area China uh, has been closely uh, watching throughout the Ukraine war because it realizes that one day China may also face a similar si situation uh, Russia is now facing. If uh, there's a war breaks out uh, uh, in the Taiwan Strait, for example, uh, so uh, we know that uh, China is already the world's leading uh, tra uh, trader and also the world's second largest economy. Yet it still relies heavily upon the international payment in terms of US dollars. So that's why once the United States is cutting China's access to the US dollar payment system globally, China may face huge financial security uh, challenges. Uh, so China now is thinking about all kinds of uh, uh, solutions uh, to bypass such kind of dilemma of uh, renminbi. Beijing has been working hard to internationalize the UN. For example, it launched CIPS, or Cross-Border Interbank Payment System, which is an alternative to SWIFT. As of 2021, it was reported that 1,280 financial institutions in 103 countries are connected to the system. The Bank of China had also stepped up bilateral local currency swap agreements with 22 central banks and authorized UN clearing banks in Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. The Chinese currency has definitely been making inroads internationally. In 2021, UN settlement jumped 20.7% to 5.77 trillion yuan for cross-border trade settlement. In the first half of 2022, spurred by the events in Ukraine, the figure jumped another 31% year on year. In October 2022, it was announced that the yuan had become the fifth most actively traded currency in the world for the first time but it still lags far behind the U.S. dollar in trading volume. There's a lot of limitations to the renminbi that, that make it uh, unfavorable for a lot of, lot of countries to use for transactions. So they've struggled to, to achieve that independence. Like what, for example, what's stopping more countries from adopting it? Well, I mean, there's, there's a number of problems with the renminbi. First of all, it's, it, 
it's not freely floating. It's not, you know, its value is not determined by markets. Uh, it's determined by the state. So it's a fixed. Um, it trades in a very narrow band determined by the, by the central bank of China. Um, so, so other countries don't really have control over it, uh, and it's not driven by market forces. So it's not self-regulating. Um, I think you also have a problem, of course, with you know, China's balance of payments, um, and and countries don't want to necessarily be holding large amounts of renminbi if they don't have certainty about how China is going to change the valuation. There's a massive issue around transparency. And Hasn't their valuation kind of stayed the same over the last 10 years? Except for when it doesn't. I mean, the problem is the lack of transparency, the potential for very arbitrary political decision making, uh, which doesn't happen necessarily with markets, or at least if it happens within a market, it's explainable and understandable and driven by the behavior of those international partners. Technology independence, energy independence, food independence, and financial independence. How does all this tie in with President Xi's message to prepare for dangerous storms? Actually, self-reliance has been the Communist Party of China's long-term strategy since the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949. So there's not much new about it. But the issue is that I think uh, after Xi Jinping came to power, he emphasized more and more on the self-reliance in every aspect, including the financial security, energy security, uh, food security, and also technological security. Uh, so one of the contests uh, in which he's emphasizing this kind of self-reliance is the geopolitical tension with the United States. So these days, as uh, the Chinese uh, are seeing more and more sanctions from the United States, they realize that actually they have to rely more and more on themselves in terms of the access to these very important resources. So that's why I think these days China has become more and more self-reliant on its domestic capacities than before. Are we going to see a China that is more sealed off from the rest of the world as it prepares for dangerous storms to quote President Xi? I think the country is still emphasizing the opening up, uh, the globalization. So we are seeing that actually they still need uh, the resources from other countries. So the aim is to be more self-reliant, but also to open up to the world at the same time. So it's a kind of dual strategy, yeah. The Communist Party has been very concerned about foreign entanglement, about foreign dependencies. But when you get to the Xi Jinping era, he's really taken it to another level. Um, his risk perception is very acute. Do you think that everything that we discussed points towards a China that is preparing for war? I mean, Xi Jinping certainly talks about war a lot. He regularly exhorts the PLA to prepare for war. He gives them very clear operational objectives, uh, strategic objectives for war fighting. And he started using martial terms more often, words like struggle, uh, words like, you know, prepare for war, uh, prepare for difficult times ahead. A lot of, of language that really creates a sense of urgency within the party cadre um, bureaucracy as well as the government bureaucracy. So by using these warlike analogies, that creates the condition for, uh, for, for, for conflict. America 五眼联盟到兜售四边机制，拼凑三边合作伙伴关系，收紧双边军事同盟。美国在台地区排出的五四三二阵势，带来的绝不是什么福音，而是搅乱地区和平稳定的祸水。Isn't the U.S. also preparing for war? Belatedly and very slowly. Um, I mean, the U.S. has been at war with. You know, the Middle East for two decades. It's been very focused on that conflict. 
is not mobilizing its society and its economy. So I think China is much more acutely aware of the potential for conflict than the U.S. If, if you talk to people in China, they're acutely aware of, of the United States and, and, and the perceived threat to it. But if you go to the United States, you know, the average person doesn't think about China. What about the political um, elites in the U.S.? Certainly, since the Trump administration began, the Washington is, has had a pretty bipartisan consensus that China represents a threat. Uh, but representing a threat to American democracy, uh, uh, American jobs, uh, American security is very different than preparing for war. Um, and, and I think you'll also find there's a big gap between the capital, Washington, and also between Wall Street um, and between Main Street. I think there's, there's a big divide in terms of how they view uh, Asia Pacific, uh, their level of understanding and their risk calculation and, and, and their perception of cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> Gang